This week, we're going to talk about desire. This will be a theme that comes up in a few, uh, a few, a few of these sessions. Uh, so let's read, uh, let's read the statement on desire, and then we can get into some of the nitty gritty. We affirm not only that our inclination towards sin as a result of the fall, so not only the corruption of our natures, but that our fallen desires are in themselves sinful. The desire for an illicit, that means illegal, an illicit end, whether in sexual desire for a person of the same sex or in sexual desire disconnected from the context of biblical marriage, is itself an illicit desire. Therefore, the experience of same-sex attraction is not morally neutral. The attraction is an expression of original or indwelling sin that must be repented of and put to death. Nevertheless, we must celebrate that, despite the continuing presence of sinful desires and even at times egregious sinful behavior, repentant, justified, and adopted believers are free from condemnation through the imputed righteousness of Christ and are able to please God by walking in the Spirit. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about a few of these things because, the, uh, because the, the, the report, obviously, with its, uh, with its view towards specifically addressing uh, questions of, of homosexuality and transgenderism focuses on that aspect in discussing uh, fallen desires. But obviously, it is applicable much more broadly than that. This is, these aren't things that are only true uh, about folks who are same-sex attracted. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit. There are a couple of different scripture passages I'd like us to read. Um, they're on your page there. Is anyone able to read one of them anyway? Romans 6, 11, and 12. Thank you. And the second one, uh, can anyone read? Uh, it's, it's two separate uh, uh, verses in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.14 and 2.11. Anybody? Thank you. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay, and 2.11? 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Good. So all of these passages mention, the English word in the ESV is passions in all of the, in all of the passages. Um, what does that mean when it talks about passions. What are we talking, or what is the Bible talking about there when it mentions passions in all three of those, all three of those verses? Unbiblical desires. Okay, yeah. So passions is talking about desires here, things that you want, things that you long for, okay? Uh, and that the uh, the context in each makes it clear that, that the passions that it's talking about are not okay, not good, right? You said, you said sinful desires. So this is, this is covered uh, both in, uh, in, in all of these. So Romans 6 says, uh, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Okay, and the its refers to sin. 
So the idea in Romans 6 is that <clears throat> sin uh, has passions that it wants to make you obey. And Paul says, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies uh, to, make you, to make you obey its passions. Okay? The idea is that there are desires within you, things that you uh, long for, think about, desire... Uh, that arise from the sin that remains within you. Uh, as the report puts it, uh, based on your, your original sin, your original corruption, and, based on, uh, and or based on indwelling sin, sin that you have, um, that you have sort of um, uh, nurtured and, uh, and, and brought, into your, brought into your life in some way. And similar language is used in 1 Peter 1 and 2, to not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, that is the, the desires that you said yes to prior to your conversion to the faith, and to abstain from uh, the passions that wage war against your soul. Again, desires that are, uh, that are contrary to what is good for you. Okay? Um, good. So I kind of jumped ahead and answered the second question there, but let's, let's take a stab at it and see if someone can say it in their own words. Um, what, what are the nature of these passions that are described, say, in Romans 6? What does it mean that sin has passions that it wants to make you obey in Romans chapter 6? The desires are What? To use our phrases from before, good, bad, neutral, what? Good, sinful, bad, wicked, okay? Whatever, whatever word you want to use there. That it is possible uh, that it exists, it is. That there are things that live inside of us, desires that we have in our minds and in our hearts uh, that do not proceed from the Holy Spirit, that are not godly, that are tainted by uh, and arise from sin, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and the, report, uh, the report puts it this way. That, uh, that, uh, that a desire uh, for, it says, an illicit end, a desire for something that is sinful is sinful. So not only is the thing itself that you, that you want, the thing that is bad, not only is the bad thing sinful, but the desire for the bad thing is sinful. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so, how does that mesh with how we, uh, how does that mesh with the general, broader social discussion that we hear around desires in in the world around us? Is it, is it in, uh, how do I want to put it? Does it mesh well with what we hear generally about our discussion of the things that we want in the world around us, or does it run against it? Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, so what, what are we told, generally speaking? Don't, yeah, okay. So generally, generally what we hear uh, is that we usually hear things like you must follow your, what's the last word? Heart. heart. Thank you. And what does that mean? Whatever makes you feel good as long as it doesn't yes. hurt. That's right. Do, do the thing that you want to do because, because what's the assumption about our hearts in this 
yeah, your heart is never going to lead you wrong, right? If you want to find the way you should go, just listen to your heart and you'll never go wrong. Okay, the problem is, let's go back to our discussion of original sin from two weeks ago. What's the state of our heart? Naturally, as we are born into this fallen world, what is the state of our heart? Good. We are guilty and corrupted in our natures. Which means that it can be deceitful. Okay, are there times where it's okay to follow your heart? Sure, if you're choosing between cornflakes and Cheerios in the morning, have at it, man. Whichever one, whichever one is going to make you feel the best, you go for it, okay? However, that is not good advice most of the time, okay? Because of this. Because... Our hearts can do us wrong because our hearts can lead us astray because we can desire things that are bad for us, okay? And the reason that there was some, uh, some particular focus paid attention to this is that in Catholic theology, uh, a desire for an illicit end only becomes a sin when it's assented to by an act of the will. So it's only when you decide to, um, to entertain and pursue that desire that you have begun to sin. Okay, so the, 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 the way that this is treated in, in Catholic theology is that the desire itself is morally neutral and it doesn't become a sin until you, uh, until you assent to it with an act of the will. Henry. Is that the same as temptation? Temptation and desire, are they the same thing? I'm going to ask you to hold that question until the week on temptation. Is that okay? Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, by the way, that week is Eric, so just let him have it, okay? <laughs> all right, good. Okay. So, what we've established so far is that it is possible... And in fact, it happens for us to have desires for things that are, uh, that are not good, that are displeasing to God, that are sinful, that are wicked, that are corrupt, all of those things, okay? And that the desire itself is sinful, okay? The desire for something that is wrong, it's not just the wrong thing that's wrong, it's also the desire for it that's wrong. Does that make sense? Okay, so what do we do with sin? Kill it? Run away from it? What's a good word that sort of encapsulates all those things? Good theological word. Good. We repent of sin. Okay? And repent always re refers to turning. Okay? So we turn away from the sin and we turn to the Lord. So, the report mentions a, a couple of uh, things, a couple of desires that are, that are sinful desires, and it particularly mentions a, a, a sexual desire for someone of the same sex, and it mentions that because that is a point of debate uh, in the sort of conversation around this in the broader Christian world in the West right now is that um, there, is, there is a way of talking about this that will sometimes say uh, a, a sexual desire for someone of the same sex is itself morally neutral. It only becomes a sin when you decide to act on it, okay? But what we're saying is the desire for an illicit thing is itself sinful. Now, what are some other things... What are some other illicit desires that, uh, uh, that we find ourselves having? Even if we want to stay in the same arena, uh, if we still want to be talking about our sexuality, okay? So same-sex desire is in that camp. What else? 
Is that the only one? Yeah, good. So, uh, so desire for someone, uh, desire for someone not your spouse. What if you're not married? Yeah, okay. So desire, they're still not your spouse. That's good. That's an excellent point, Joel. Desire, <laughs> uh, desire, um, I think that's the phrase they use in the report there. Desire outside the context of marriage. Okay? So this isn't just some foreign thing that, only, uh, that is only experienced by folks who are same-sex attracted, right? We all experience desires in different ways, and it's not only about sex, by the way. This is true in just about every aspect of our lives, is that we all experience desires for things that we ought not have desires for, okay? And we said that the desire for an illicit thing is in itself sinful, and what we do with sin is we repent of it. So, rubber meets the road. What does it look like for us to repent of sinful desires? Let's talk about it maybe, um, uh, let's choose the one, let's choose the one where we're talking about adultery, okay? Desire for someone, not your spouse. It's not just that it becomes bad if you decide to fantasize about that person or flirt with that person or sleep with that person. It's that the desire itself is sinful, right? So <clears throat> it's fairly clear that we ought to stay away from those things that involve acting on it, right? But how do we repent of the desire itself? What does that look like? Good. It's always a great first step. Confess it. Who would you confess it to? Whom would you confess it to? Jesus. Good. Confess to the Lord. Anybody else? Okay. You could confess it to your spouse. Yeah, so confess it to, yeah, accountability partner, just someone else. Why? This is the easiest, right? Because that guy is always forgiving. Why? And this is, this is the one we like to just stick to, right? Because it fit, and if we're being completely honest, feels like we're still keeping it secret, right? We get to keep our... We get to keep our reputations intact. We don't have to have any uncomfortable conversations. Why might these other things be important for us too? They may not like the fact that we do. Okay, good. It, yeah, it could get uncomfortable. Um, it could be a very hard conversation, right? So that's why we don't want to do it. Why should we do it? Why should we do one of those things? Good to become accountable. Because confessing your sin out loud takes the power of sin away. Ah, okay. Sin becomes less powerful when we confess it out loud. Why is that? Not just you, anybody. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> Why? Why is that? I agree. It's true. She's right. Why is that? Yes, good, very good. Okay. Sin thrives in the dark. Wouldn't it help to also make you ashamed of your sin? Okay. You will be like, oh, by now they know I really have to be careful. Yep. Yes, so it... Uh, I think, I think that's the idea. Someone else said uh, something like it, uh, it creates accountability, which, is, which I think is the idea, right? It's, it feels like, it's interesting that we think that way because you would think that the most powerful motivator on that, on that front would be the Lord knowing, right? The one, who is, um, the one who is perfect and 
uh, reveals every thought of our hearts and knows the innermost working of our mind and our hearts, we would think that him knowing would be the one that would, that would, um, uh, that would be a bit of a spur to us to want to um, wanna change. But that's often not the case. And, uh, and often it's, it's, it's a far greater motivator for us to have the people in the flesh that we know and live with uh, every day who, who, can, who can ask us hard questions and who can follow up with us and to actually, and to actually know. Um, okay, why else would it be good for us to confess? Okay. So we can receive wisdom, counsel, input from others. I think your response is to fight against it because the more we become aware of our sin, we have to confess that during yeah. prayer time. You have to think about what you've done in the week, and then you come week after week to confess the same things. Yep. You become aware of what you have to work on. Good. Good. That's a good reason. What are we afraid is going to happen? If we tell, good. We're afraid of rejection, right? Ooh, dramatic rejection. I like that. Like it's scripted in a play or something like that. I like that. Um, yes. It actually strengthens relationships. Ah. Yeah. So what happens when we confess and this doesn't happen? Yeah. Good. Builds trust. Good. Builds fellowship. It's a little instantiation, a little reenactment of the gospel every time that happens, right? Because that's what we're afraid of. We're afraid that our, that our sins are going to make us unlovable. And so, um, and so it's a little reminder of what is actually true in Christ every time we confess and we are not rejected and people respond with forgiveness and love is it's a little, it's a little reenactment of, of the gospel, right? Okay, we confess. How are we doing on time? Are we way over already? Okay, so we're somewhat over. Uh, let's, let's take six more minutes. Uh, okay, so what else? What else would repentance of, uh, of sinful desires look like? We got confession already. What else? Yeah. Okay, good. What kind of change? Drastic. <laughs> Drastic, Okay. We can, I bet we could come up with some great adjectives, but let's, uh, let's, <laughs> fundamental, okay, um, we can, uh, <laughs> um, now, what the change looks like depends on the situation, right? It depends on, it depends on what the thing is, it depends on the circumstances in which it tends to, in which it tends to show its face, okay? Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean it's so if we're if we're sticking with we're sticking with the example of uh, of you know desire for someone who's not your spouse, maybe it's a coworker, and there are there are opportunities for you to there are ways that you could say, not completely freeze the person out because you have to work together, but you could find ways to interact with them less, uh, to interact with them only when there are other people around, um, and I mean if none of that so. We never, we never really consider the drastic measures, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, I have known, I've known people, guys, who, um, who the, and now this is back before the days of, uh, back before the days of LTE and stuff like that, which is, it just shows you how old I am. But I know, I, like, I know guys who the, who the, um, the, the temptation towards pornography when they were home was so strong that they just got rid of the internet in their house and just didn't have it anymore. And it was super inconvenient for them, uh, but in their mind was better 
than, um, than giving in to that temptation. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's what everybody has to do. It means that we come to know ourselves better and our own desires better and our own, uh, our own triggers that, uh, that, that tend to bring up those sinful desires in ourselves better and we can put together a plan of attack uh, based, on, based on that knowledge and based on our own relative strengths and weaknesses, um, which is another reason why it's good for other people to know because they might tell you that something's a good idea that you didn't think of or that you didn't want to do. Um, and so, uh, anyway, yes, okay, good. Anything else? So, good, thank you. So we have, we've been talking about the sort of the remove side of, of repentance, where we deal with the sin itself, but the other side is always replace. Frank used the word pursue. So um, what are we talking about? What does that mean? Yeah, good. So um, in Galatians 5, as Paul is leading into his discussion of the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians 5, he starts out by listing all of these desires of the flesh, right? People that, uh, people that, uh, people, things that uh, people were doing that were, that were the outworking of their sinful desires. And he says, you guys did these things before you believed in your former ignorance. And he says, and if you do not want to gratify the desires of the flesh, what does he tell them to do? He says, walk in step with the Spirit. And then he goes on to list love, joy, peace, patience, all the, all the rest of them. And the idea is that the best way, not that it's a silver bullet, not that it works perfectly every time, not that it does it magically, but the best way to, uh, to kill sinful desires is to replace it with good ones. Okay, To find the good thing in this arena... Uh, in whatever area this particular desire is manifesting itself, to find the good thing that you ought to be pursuing that you've been ignoring and, and you know, nurturing this other thing. And so let's say you're married. Let's say you're married, and that's because that's the, that's the example we've been using. And you're dealing with sinful desire for someone who's not your spouse. What is the thing that you ought to be, or one of the things, that you ought to be replacing that desire with? Good. Desire for your spouse. Okay. Sexually, obviously, but also simple things like finding new ways in your relationship, around the house, in the way that you guys live together, little new ways to die to yourself and to learn to do what is, what is good for them. New ways to serve and to love them. These, these are actually things that are really good at helping us grow in, in love for the people that we are supposed to pursue and pour ourselves into in life. And generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, um, those, those illicit desires tend to become uh, a little bit less appealing. Uh, they get a little bit less airtime in your head when when you are when you're just when you're just caught up in being absolutely in love with your spouse and wanting to find ways to do to do good things for them um, yeah okay so now we're now we're way over okay um, all right anything else anything else that should be added or any questions that you had about any of the stuff that we talked about today Frank. Yes. All expressions of all desires are necessarily something you did want. So, for example, homosexuality, I've had this conversation recently where, are you born a homosexual mm. or have with homosexual desires, or is that something you choose? Good question. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't want to give a blanket answer for every individual person because I think it's, um, I think sometimes there are 
environmental factors that, that, that play into things like that. Um, I accept the possibility that it's possible for people to be born with that particular sinful desire because original sin is true. If original sin weren't true, that would be a really problematic thing because if we're born sort of internally morally neutral, then anything that we're born with uh, is therefore good or at least neutral, right? But if it, is, if it is the case that we are born with corruption, then it wouldn't surprise me at all to find, um, obviously, not only that particular manifestation of corruption, but any manifestation of corruption to be there from, to be there from birth, right? That, that doesn't, uh, but the, the, um, the, the follow-on to that is that that doesn't make it something good, Right? Because the underlying, the underlying way of reasoning uh, that, that people have when they make that argument is that I was born with it. If I was born with it, it can't be bad. Therefore, it must be good. Um, but we're saying it is actually entirely possible. Uh, in fact, it happens with all of us just in different ways for us to be born with something that is not good, something of which we need to repent. Sounds like a good place to end. See you next week. This class meets again next week. See you then. Yeah, thank you.